In this video, we're going to be discussing measurement rules and how they apply to a larger topic, which is significant digits. All of this stuff eventually gets bundled together, and this is how you're going to be making measurements and recording data throughout the year. It's a little bit of an abstract idea to wrap your head around, but it is also one of the more important ones we talk about in the beginning. It will be reflected in a lot of grades, so it's something you need to be very good with. So let's talk a little bit about what it is you guys are going to be doing. Uh, first of all, I think it's important we define what significant digits are. This video is definitely more about measurement, but measurement and significant digits are completely tied together. You can't really talk about one without the other. Once we understand what a significant digit is, it's time to connect that back to that idea of measuring again. We want to discuss the rules for making correct measurements by maximizing the amount of significant digits you can record from any measuring device. It's our job as researchers to get as much information about the world around us as possible and using those measuring tools to the maximum of their capability is going to get you that information. Anything less means you're leaving information on the table. Anything more, and now you've got data that actually doesn't make a lot of sense and that can get you into a lot of trouble. So, that's the plan for today. Let's start by talking about what significant digits actually are. Uh, the formal definition, the thing you definitely write down here, is a significant digit is any digit in a number that represents a measurement from a measuring device. Hence the word significant. We call these digits significant because they represent a real object or event in our world. These are the numbers that connect what we do theoretically in the lab to what's really happening in the universe around us. And that's what science is really trying to get at, what's happening in the universe around us. So significant digits are the numbers that represent that universe. Now something else we can say about our uh, measuring tools is that the more significant digits we have, the more information we're going to get about our sample. Each one of those digits represents a little more detail about the object or event we're measuring. If we can get more of those, uh, then we get a better measurement itself. Unfortunately, those more significant digits come at a cost. Higher quality instruments can provide those more, uh, those more significant digits, but you have to pay for that. And a lot of times, extra significant digits don't just come at a little cost, they come at a very big one. Here's a very quick example of what I'm talking about. This is a device you're going to see a lot of in this year. This is something known as a digital balance. Uh, we use these very commonly. Uh, digital balances just to give some quick information. They read one to two decimal places, uh, and you can see that in the picture we have on the left. Uh, and ultimately, with the, the whole numbers, they provide somewhere in the vicinity of four to five significant digits each. That's actually pretty good. Uh, it, it's not the best kind of data out there, but the real advantage of a digital balance is that it's super duper fast. It gets you that information in about a second. If you wanted one of these things for yourself, they probably cost you somewhere in the vicinity of $350 a piece. They are precision instruments, a lot of calibration, a lot of finely made mechanics in there, uh, hence the price tag we're dealing with. Let's take something a little less uh, high tech, a triple beam balance. I'm sure everyone's worked with these at least once in a time before. Uh, and a lot of times students make the mistake of assuming a triple beam balance is a lesser piece of equipment. Uh, when in actuality, the triple beam balances we have here at the school read three decimal places each. They actually get a lot more information than that digital balance does. Altogether, you're looking at somewhere between four and six, uh, six significant digits worth of data. So more information. This is a better measuring tool than a digital balance is. You get better quality data, but unfortunately you pay the price in terms of time. Uh, as you've used these before, they're slow and cumbersome. Uh, and it makes labs a lot longer to work, deal with. Because of that time, the price tag on these tends to be a little bit lower. You can get one of these guys for somewhere in the vicinity of $200 a piece. Our last device is something known as an analytical balance. This is a digital balance on steroids, if you will. It's much more souped up, much finer precision. Uh, this reads at least four decimal places. Um, you can get ones that read more than that you get somewhere in the vicinity of five to ten significant digits worth of data. That's a lot of information. It's a very detailed measurement. And, like the electronic balance from before, not only is the data quality excellent, uh, but it's very fast as well. These guys get um, some very quick results. 
And that is something you definitely pay for. Depending on the quality, depending on the number of significant digits you're talking about here, these can be from the thousands to the tens of thousands of dollars in the price range. And it's almost as if each new significant digit you tag on the end, you get a not a linear increase in the price, but an exponential increase in the price. You go from $1,000 for four to ten, tens of thousands of dollars for five and, and, and on and on and on. My point with all of this is that significant digits are something scientists value very importantly, and getting more of them, getting an extra significant digit, is something people are definitely willing to pay for if your research demands that kind of information. Now, let's change gears a little bit here, and I want to actually get back to the process of measuring itself. Let's talk about the rules for making an appropriate measurement. So, quality of the device aside, there's rules for handling each measuring device out there. So here's a quick picture of a measuring device. We have a, a cross-section here of a ruler. Uh, and on the ruler, we see delineations of different lines here. For example, we have the ones read by these big lines. And then we have the tenths read by the smaller lines here. And we could even go so far as to say we've got the tens column taken care of as well. This represents groups of lines, and the ruler draws them all differently to separate them from one another. Longer lines for the ones, shorter lines for the tenths. Each group of these lines on your measuring device reads a place in your number. These read what happens in the one columns. This guy reads what happens in the tens column, and the little guys here read what happens in the tenths column. Each one of these groups provides you with a significant digit. It provides you with a digit that you can write down that represents a real item in the real world. So this is how we're going to be looking at these things and this idea of having these separate groups I think is very very important. So speaking of measuring, let's actually try and measure an object and we're going to talk about the rules for making those correct measurements as we do this. Rule number one, this is the easy rule. Your job is to record and read all of the available groups of lines. There's no reason to ha that you would have a ruler that measured down to the tenths, but you only bothered to measure the ones. You're going to go down to as fine as the ruler or whatever measuring device is goes. So here's a quick example. This is a very high-res picture of a four-leaf clover here. Uh, we've taken our measuring tool from the previous slide, and we've lined it up properly uh, so that we can make this measurement. Now if we go to make this measurement, we can use the measuring tool and actually see if we can't record some of this information down. For example, I see that my measuring device, when lined up next to my four-leaf clover here, passes the seven mark, which means I can put information in the ones column and say that my four-leaf clover is at least seven centimeters long. Well, we can do more than that because there's smaller lines that go along with this. And I can count along here, and I can see that it passes this line, this one, three, four, five, and six. So I can say that this uh, four-leaf clover is now 7.6 centimeters long. We've taken a very general measurement of just seven centimeters, and we've added more information by making it more specific. Now it's 7.6 centimeters. We know more about the dimensions of our four-leaf clover. Now notice I call that rule number one. This is as far as we can go in terms of the measuring device lines themselves, but rule number one implies that there's going to be a rule number two. So let's take a look at what that is. Rule number two says you have to estimate one more place. And this is where people tend to drop the ball a little bit. You want to estimate one more place after you've run out of your little lines. So our ruler from before can measure down to the tenths place. That means I want you to estimate down to the hundredths. And the way we do this is by looking at the distance between the two smallest lines on our measuring tool. And we can look at that distance and estimate how far along our object is between those two smallest lines. So let's bring our clover up again with our measuring device. We've already said that this clover is seven centimeters. It is six tenths of a centimeter. And now we can zoom in and look really close in this region and estimate the space in between the 0.6 line and the 0.7 line. And by looking at it from me, 
I can see that it almost gets to the 0.7 line, but not quite. I am going to estimate that this is 6 point, or 7.67 centimeters long. We've now gotten a new bit of information. We've refined the measurement even further, uh, and that's the limit of this measuring device. Now, sometimes people, bo this bothers them a little bit because this is estimated, which means that my measurement here is going to be a little different than your measurement here. But even though our measurements are going to be different, I think we can all agree that um, they're going to be close. My 7 might be your 8, and there might be someone else's 6, but we're not expecting to see a lot of 9s, and we're not expecting to see a lot of 5s, and we certainly shouldn't expect to see 1s and 2s. So even though it's not a perfect number, it's a number that's it has some meaning, it has some connection to it, and it does relate back to the actual dimension here. Taking this discussion a step further, if we tried to estimate another place, the thousands place, then I think we would find you couldn't make that delineation with your eyes, and my estimate and your estimate would be vastly different. In fact, I would imagine we get random estimates there, and that's not an estimate anymore, that's a guess. So this is the place we stop, and this particular measuring device forces us to stop at the hundreds place. If we wanted more, we'd have to get a measuring tool with finer and finer lines on it that would allow us to measure more places and then estimate further. But that's the limit we have here. That's really what I need you guys to be able to identify with your measuring device is what is the limit. You have to make it to that limit without going past every single time you use it. To summarize, let's go over what we talked about. Uh, significant digits only come from the measuring device themselves. You can't generate this information without having a measuring tool of some sort. They are what the measuring device gives you. Uh, if you want to make that measurement better, that just means you need to get a better device. There's no trick we can use outside of the lab to improve the quality of our measurements. Then we talked really quickly about some of the rules that we're using here. And this is actually the real key of this whole discussion is these rules. You measure all the places provided by your measuring device, and then do the rule that people tend to forget, this guy right here. You always estimate one more place by looking at the distance between the two lines. Uh, and that gets you the full extent of the measuring device's capabilities. And that's always where you want to get. Here's the last little tip. Uh, you should always, every single time, you should always get the same number of decimal places and or significant digits from a particular measuring device. The device always has the same lines, it always has the same number of gradients, and as a result, it should always give the same type of an answer back. This is a great thing to watch out for when doing labs or work. If you're seeing your data values don't match up with one another, that means you're making some mistakes along the way. You might have to go back and remeasure some items until those significant digits definitely match. As always, uh, if you're having trouble with the topic, Please check your book, check uh, the resources we have from class to see if you can clarify things. And if you need to, definitely come in and see me, and I'll be glad to uh, walk you through any part of this process to clear things up. It's an abstract idea, and this is tough for kids to wrap their head around. Make sure you invest the time necessary to get that job done.